Good evening, everyone, and welcome to A Time with the SL. Oh Lord, our God, we open our hearts as we take our Bibles to study. May your spirit reveal to us the realities of your word and let our hearts to conform to your will. Amen. Still in our month of new beginnings, today our message is titled, Experience the Gift of a New Beginning. We're taking our text from John 8, 1 to 11. And I read, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left. With the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. Oof. I love this story. Okay, you will say, SL, there are so many stories you love. Well, I love the Bible. I love the Bible. The lesson today is one of those lessons that was actually avoided by the early church. It was not a very common, it wasn't a story that they encouraged people to tell. And if you study the history of the Bible, it was one of those manuscripts, one of those that was left out of the early manuscripts. And we know that this is Jesus' second discourse in the temple. Only a day or so before this event, many had marveled at his doctrine. And from what we read in scripture, the jealous Jewish leaders accused Jesus of having a devil. Jesus was rebuked and embarrassed many times. But you know, these things didn't stay on him. Rather, the embarrassment went back on the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus told them, why are you so inconsistent? Why are you so inconsistent? They were actually giving Jesus, they, they, the, the credit they were meant to give to Jesus, they started giving to the devil when they said that Jesus had a devil. So they were saying that the power, the ability that Christ had came from the devil. And it was the envy of the Jews that actually caused them to seek to kill Jesus. And we still see this envy and jealousy today. Envy and jealousy are the root cause of so much destruction in the world. I say to people often, when someone comes to tell you about another person, some, something negative, the first thing you should ask yourself is, hmm, what was the motive behind this conversation? Could be envy and jealousy. Could be envy and jealousy. I found that a lot in my life where typically someone who I know, someone who doesn't like me for no just cause, I, it's jealousy. It's jealousy. So I advise people, I say, if someone asks you to join their battle against somebody, you might just be fighting against your helper. <laughs> Now, what we see in our text is official officers have been sent to formally arrest Jesus, but every attempt ends in failure. So as far as they are concerned, they found the perfect solution to their problem. They found a woman with a problem that provides them a new opportunity to ensnare Jesus with his own words. That is why it's important for us to be careful how we speak and where we speak. What they were trying to do was to pit the compassion of Jesus against the law of Moses. 
They knew that Jesus had a compassionate heart. Jesus didn't want to hurt anybody. And so the story goes this way, that Jesus had taught all day in the temple. Overnight, he retired to a hillside of the Mount of Olives. We're not told why, but this is a clear example of Jesus Christ. He didn't have a place to sleep, so he was sleeping in the open. I need you to understand the life of Christ. So sometimes when you see men and women of God living lives that don't make sense to you, leave them. They know what it is they are doing. Jesus slept overnight outside that night. Perhaps no one welcomed him into their home. Maybe he had said some things that riled people and people were afraid to have him in their home. Maybe Jesus was afraid of staying in the city, not out of fear, so to speak. Perhaps he just wanted to get away from the tension. Maybe just the pressure of ministry. I find that there are times when I just want to be alone. I don't want to have anyone around me. And it's not there's anything, but I just need to be alone. Maybe that's what he was feeling at that time when he went to sleep on the Mount of Olives. But early in the morning, he comes back. He goes back to his duty. He goes back to his duty. I remember when I, the, the days after I lost my mom, my mother passed away. I remember the next morning and taking the 5 a.m. declarations. And someone said to me, Esther, how were you able to do it? I said, but it's a duty that I have to do. So Jesus returned early the next morning back to his duty, back to the house of prayer. He sat and taught all who came unto him. The scribes and the Pharisees, who were the learned men, who studied the who they, that their job is to study the law. Systematically, they're the legal experts of the day. They then brought this woman to Jesus. They brought this woman to Jesus, and as far as they were concerned, now is a good situation. Finally, we have the best situation. Let's combine our efforts and trap Jesus together. And we are told that their motives were to trap Jesus with his words. To trap Jesus with his words. That was their motive. They had no desire to bless their community, nor to hold God's standard. No, it had nothing to do with God. It was not a godly agenda they had. They had no interest in the woman or what this woman was going through. They wanted to use this woman. They wanted to expose Jesus as a teacher without compassion or as one who did not practice or regard the law of Moses or one of two. Either way, they were going to nail Jesus with something. See, these were men who had great reputation. They were the most popular sect, the Pharisees, and they practiced both the law and the traditions of the elders. So they are the GOs. They are the ones that they study the word. They are the generals. <laughs> and from the story, you notice they barge in to take control. They have this woman in custody. They arrest the crowd by causing a disturbance. And now they want to control Jesus. So they force the woman, sit down. Sit down. Tell her in the midst. And then they now have their captive audience. Everyone is watching them. They list the charges brought against her. And they bring the formal charge of adultery against the woman. And they have several credible eyewitnesses. Now, they begin. Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what seest thou? <laughs> this woman was in trouble. She was in big trouble. Her plight was bleak. Because she was guilty. She was guilty as charged. Note, this woman at no point said anything. She did not complain. She did not deny the charge. She did not say they were treating her harshly or unfairly. Her head was bowed in sin and shame. Sin because she had transgressed the commandments of God. Shame because she had been caught and openly exposed. That's what happens to a lot of us. The shame only comes when they catch us. If they don't catch us, it's fine. 
So the evidence against this woman was very clear. The law against her was clear. The Pharisees and the scribes, they knew the law. And they wanted to use this woman as a pawn in their scheme. And they were succeeding. So, this thing they had done, in this one move, they could condemn the woman. They could turn the crowd against her and turn them away from the influence of Jesus. All they wanted was one slip of the tongue. That would have been the end of Jesus. Jesus just needed to say the wrong thing, what they didn't want to hear. And guess what, beloved? You see this woman? She's an example of every sinner. Is me, is you. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Her case seemed to be open and shut. They didn't need to call any additional witnesses. She was caught. No jury needs to be selected. She was caught. All that was needed now was for Jesus to pronounce the judgment. That's what they came to meet Jesus for. Tell us, is she guilty or is she innocent? As guilty as this woman was, with a sure sentence of death abiding, they call Jesus Master and ask, What sayest thou? <laughs> Remember the day before, these terrible men had called Jesus a deceiver. They said he was a devil. They said he was not a prophet. And now they flatter him the next day and they are calling him a Master. It reminds me of when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem and they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us, save us, save us. That was on Sunday. By Friday, the same people are shouting, crucify him, crucify him. This is life. Oh. Don't look at human beings as anything. Now, this woman is guilty. She's guilty. <laughs> She's guilty. She finds herself in the right place, though, at the feet of Jesus. I will tell you this. The feet of Jesus are the starting place for forgiveness and acceptance. Once you can find yourself there, know that you are all right. Let's look at our situation. The situation was dire. The situation was a challenge. But did Jesus flinch? He didn't flinch. It did not cost any, it, there was no, it didn't, it didn't cost Jesus any alarm. He didn't, he was just okay. When we are in challenges, we'll be shaking. How am I going to do this? You know, we must always stop. I've learned this. I've learned it and I'm learning it that once I'm faced with any challenge, just calm down. SL, calm down. Whose feet are you sitting at right now? The accuser said to Jesus, we caught her in the very act. What did Jesus do? Jesus ignored the crowd. It's like when you start driving, the first thing I tell any Elena driver is when you're driving, just those people that are honing at you on the road, just ignore them. You just be driving your own. That's all. Don't respond to the nonsense that is going on around you. Jesus ignored them. He ignored the crowd. He ignored the woman. What did he do? He started writing on the ground. What Jesus wrote is unknown. But his response is calm. We don't know what he wrote, but his response is calm. He didn't listen to the outside noise. And every one of us may have found ourselves in situations so shocking that we think that God will be surprised. When you are doing that thing, God saw you now. Why do you think... That what is going to happen to you is going to shock God. Can't shock God. The men in this text would not accept Jesus' silence. And they continued to pressure him. They wanted Jesus to talk. What do you say? What do you say? Master, talk now. Talk now. What do you say? Isn't that how it is when you are in trouble? People are braying. They want, they want a reaction. The beauty of God is that this woman found herself guilty, but she was not condemned. You may be guilty, you are not condemned. You may be guilty. So I'm not, you know, sometimes we want the thing to go away, but then you start making excuses. Mm -mm, don't make any excuses. If you did something and you are in trouble, own up to the trouble, but you are not condemned. And Jesus gives a short and to the point answer. So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. Now, Jesus was not the magistrate. He was only following Jewish protocol in which the key witness is to inflict the first blow. 
that's what it is. You saw this person do it, Abby. Oh yeah, hit her. Sometimes that means you push the victim over the brow on a hill. Other times it's casting the first stone. If you are sure of what you saw, do what you want to do to the person. Why are you calling other people to join you in it? You saw her. You saw that person do the wrong. Abby, you know they did the wrong. Okay, judge them yourself. That is what Jesus is saying. And Jesus, his response exposed the plot of the critics. And at the same time, he must have stirred up a conviction of their conscience. Many reasons are suggested. We don't know what happened that day. And all of these are just speculations. So this is not, I'm not saying anything to be the gospel truth. Maybe Jesus' answer caused his critics to realize that their plot was actually much more sinful than what the woman had done. That conspiracy, what they wanted to do was actually worse than the adultery that woman was found in. Maybe his answer caused them to remember that the law required that not only do you bring the woman, you bring the man also. And there was no man there. Because maybe the man was one of them. Maybe something Jesus wrote on the ground pricked their conscience about their own lives. This is what I know to be fact. I know that the woman was guilty, but she was not condemned. She was guilty, she was not condemned. And the lesson teaches us that God is not nearly as interested in condemning people as we are. We like to condemn people. We have to recondemn ourselves. No matter where we find needy people, what we do is we bring them to Jesus. We bring them to Jesus. It's Jesus that knows how to handle the situation. You don't. If not, you would be Jesus. I've learned that Jesus has a response to every situation and Jesus has a response to every person. What happened? The condemning accusers dropped their stones and they walked away. The woman lifted up her head, opened her eyes. Jesus saw her weakness. This woman is alone. This woman is hurting. And Jesus asked her two questions. Woman, we are those thine accusers. Hath no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord. I love her answer because the woman somehow recognized the lordship of Jesus. You see, she did not deny the charges. Neither did she justify what she did. Always remember that. A lot of the time, we are so quick to, to give a reason for what we have done. You have done something that is wrong. Why are you giving the reason? We know you have done something wrong. And if you can justify it, it means you are going to do it again. So stop justifying it. This woman was guilty as charged. When you do wrong, you are guilty. You did it because of this. That's not the issue. You did it. Own up to your, your, your mess. And when you own up to it, you're not going to do it again. She was guilty, but what she needed was a new beginning. And this passage is so controversial. It's so controversial that it was actually, they tried to drop it from the canon of scripture. Then it was added, but seldomly used. Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus was not excusing her actions. No. And he was not belittling her offense. He was offering a new start. Isaiah 118, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. It's as simple as that. It just requires obedience, submission. Not going back to your sin. Psalm 103.10 He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. And that's the God we serve. That's just the God we serve. You need to experience the gift of a new beginning. Jesus is still offering that new start. Religion may condemn you. Your church may not accept you. A thousand doors may be closed to you. Yet Jesus still offers a new beginning to you. 
Many of us today are like that woman in the text. We are guilty on many charges. With a line of accusers, they are pointing their fingers because of our past behavior, things we did. We too have been caught in the very act, whether it's lying, whether it's cheating, or even worse things. We have failed ourselves. We've disappointed ourselves. Yet, God will forgive. God will forgive. Many of us, we are guilty of wasting our time, our resources, our talents. Guilty of sinning against God and man. And even though we make many mistakes and we've missed the mark, God is still waiting with open arms. Yes, you may have failed to reach your goal or to live up to your potential. But all we all need is just a new start. We are guilty, but we are not condemned. Jesus simply said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You can start over afresh and you can have a new day. <laughs> the power is not in any man's hands. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 1 John 1, 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Romans 8, 1, 31 to 34. There is no condemnation now. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay one thing to the charge of God's elect? Is it God that it is God that justifieth? Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also make intercession for us? Beloved, it's the beginning of a new day, a new season. Take this new beginning that God is giving to you, please. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your loving kindness and for your faithfulness that has brought us to the eighth month of the year. Thank you for not allowing the afflictions and the challenges of this year to sweep us and our families away. It's been painful, Lord. This has been a painful year, but we are alive. O oh Lord, Father, eight represents a new beginning. Please do a new thing in our lives and in our families. Give us new beginnings in every area of our lives in Jesus' mighty name. We confess and we declare that this eighth month of the year, we will see new things in our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, let all those bad habits, those same old recurring and recycled problems completely pass away in Jesus' mighty name. Father, please forgive our sins of the past. Put a new spirit in us, Father. Enter into new covenants with us, Lord, Father. Destroy completely by your blood every evil covenant that's keeping us from doing your will and living for your glory. Destroy every covenant of failure, barrenness, fruitlessness, fruitless labor, stagnation, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Father, we establish in our lives your covenant of health, peace, prosperity, protection, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, from this month, let us be called by a new name. That name that has been given to us from you, Lord. Let us no longer be called by all those negative names and labels people have given us, Lord. Father, we confess and we declare that you have given us a new name. God, you have given us a new name. And our new name, our new name, the redeemed of the Lord. Our new name, God's delight. Our new name, blessed of the Lord. Our new name, sought after and in demand, not rejected and not forsaken. O oh Lord, this month, please do amazing things in our lives, Father. Put in our mouths new songs, new songs of praise to replace the secret tears and pains which many of us cannot discuss with anyone. 
Father, remove anything that is standing in the way of our moving forward. Father, make a way in the wilderness, Lord. Father, make rivers in the desert in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, make a way where there seems to be no way in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, Lord, we are praying this evening. Father, help us to forget our past errors, Lord. Father, help us to forget our past failures. Father, help us to press on to receive the new thing that you have for us, Lord. Father, we refuse to be limited by our past. Father, we embrace the glorious hope and future that you have prepared for us. Father, do a new thing in our nations, Lord Father. Everywhere where the rebirth ministry has a representative, our Lord and our God, Father, do only what you can do, Father. Do a new thing even in the places where we are not represented, Lord. Father, do what will convince people that you are a living God. You are truly a living God. Show all those who think they have the economy and the destiny of the nations in their hands, Lord Father, that they are mere men, Father, they are mortals that can be brought down at any time. Father, frustrate every evil agenda, Lord Father, in all nations of this world, Lord Father. Correct that with your divine touch, Lord Father, everything that has gone wrong in our nations, Lord. Father, let your revival fire fall upon the youth, my Lord and my God, Father, in lands all over. Father, give them a new beginning, Lord Father. Let our nations become lands that hold a great hope and a future for upcoming generations in the mighty name of Jesus. Our Lord and our God, we are praying this evening that you anoint us anew. Father, consume our lives and our families with a fresh fire that will make it impossible for us not to serve you, Lord, Father, and not to live to please you, Lord. Father, please turn our requests to testimonies, Father. In, 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 in turn, Lord, Father, turn our trials to triumphs in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for all you continue to do for us, Lord, Father. Our Lord and our God, you are in heaven, Lord, Father. We come before you through the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this time in your presence. Father, we've had a great time. We've had an interesting time interacting with you. A wonderful time, Lord, Father. Your word is life to us, Lord, Father. You have promised in your word, Lord, Father. If we search with all our hearts, we will find you, Lord, Father. Thank you, Lord, that you are near more than we can imagine or think of father thank you for revealing yourself through jesus christ father thank you that jesus has become our way to you lord father father as we've concluded this bible study father we go father we know you're with us lord we thank you lord for all you continue to do in jesus mighty name amen i have enjoyed this message i hope you've enjoyed it as much as i've enjoyed it if you're interested in rebirth what we do in our ministry kindly visit www.rebirthrwc.org look forward to as many of you that will be joining us lord joining us in our in our in our prayers and in our in our programs god bless you i love you with the love of the lord stay lifted